All right, well, <clears throat> we're so glad that you can gather with us here, and then, of course, others that will be joining us later via video. And uh, so we're so glad to have you all with us. We're continuing in the series of Philippians and having taken kind of an interlude into chapter 4 because I was so struck with this pressing issues of anxiety over all the stuff that's going on. I think some of the most powerful verses in the New Testament talking about that. But now we're back into chapter 2. And uh, moving forward, I, t I tell you, uh, some, some question and wonder whether God's word is relevant uh, and does it have something to say today? I, I, I know maybe I have a different perspective being a pastor, but uh, I, I look at the confluence of events in our world right now with, with what the word of God has to say. And uh, I, I, almost the question seems laughable to me. Uh, and I, I hope that you see that today. Uh, we're, we're facing things that are very difficult. It's dark out there right now. Not literally, right? Beautiful, sunshiny day. But we're talking here about a different kind of darkness. There's so much that's happening. Our state is on fire right now. Do you know that? Our state is literally on fire. And uh, it seems to be spreading from place to place. I think the running total so far is over 180 businesses looted, damaged, destroyed. I have a good friend that uh, runs a business up in the cities. And I contacted him. And how are you doing? He's like, I'm sleeping at the store. Boarded it up, guarding it. I was a little concerned for him. Started praying right there for him, like guarding it. Like, what, what's that look like? Uh, you know, if, if people come, he's still safe. But... Uh, just so much right now in terms of uh, animosity. I think about the only thing that could have got COVID off the front page is this story, is this reality, and it's in our front yard. Anger is just boiling over. For many, they said this is the last straw. So it's not like it just all of a sudden started to exist. There's just been a, a latent anger and, uh, and, and, and shouting. And this church is the church in Mississippi that was burned to the ground because they dared to meet. And uh, <clears throat> the pastor was just processing this and is sort of is laughing, sort of taunting. But you're going to social distance now and that they dared to gather. Of course, never occur to the individual to burn down a liquor store or, or, or something else, you know, that had been meeting as well. Um, and, and yet we see the enemies at work. So, you know, this has kind of become normal. Just this sort of angry, not even dialogue, just, just it's, it seems like now more, it's just shouting and yelling. There's another picture in my mind, a protest in, uh, in Michigan, where this individual was just screaming at, at one of the police. And he said, later, I wasn't yelling. It was like, <laughs> were you singing or yodeling or what? Because... You know, you're yelling. I mean, I, you cannot do that inches away from someone. And it's just, this, this is how we seem to handle things now. Disagreements are boiling over and grievances seem to, to bubble over. And there, and there just starts to be this, this anger and resentment. And civil dialogue almost seems like a, a forgotten notion. That when you don't get your way and when you don't get what you want, then you just raise up the volume and, and start yelling. And this has become normal. I get the sense that it's into this incredible reality that we desperately need God. I love the worship. Lord, we need you. And we desperately need God to speak. I, I cannot imagine a more relevant text to speak into the reality. And I tell you what, I, I, this falls clearly into the I'd rather be lucky than good category or that God has a plan because I could never have taken into chapter 4 and jumped back into 2 and I could never have come up with the idea or the plan to talk about this text at this time, but God did. So I'm just going to say, let's just quiet our hearts and invite God to speak and to do work in us as a church, in you, in your heart, in my heart, and in our state. And we intercede for our land, for it is on fire. 
Let's pray. Lord God, we just quiet our hearts and we beg for you to speak. Like little Samuel, we say, here I am, Lord. Speak. We want to be like Mary. We want to sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, and listen to you, our teacher. Lord, we need to hear you. We need to humbly come before your word and submit to its authority. So, Lord God, I ask that your spirit would be alive and active, that it would quicken, that it would cut and divide joint and marrow, that it would accomplish all that you would intend for it to do. Oh, Lord God, speak to us, your people, for we need desperately to hear you speak through your word, through your servant. We commit this time to you, Lord God, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. So let's jump into Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 14 to 18. This is just what came up next. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. How are we doing? (laughs) How are we doing as a state? Any grumbling or disputing going on? Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life, or some translations say word of truth, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon a sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should rejoice and be glad with me. So we're going back to the larger purpose in our series is that we would grow in our passion, in our purpose and progress as we are full partners in the advance of the gospel. Okay, so that's, that's the big idea for this whole Philippian series. I think it's the whole book in a nutshell. And my prayer as I started this was that God would do this book in us. So that at the end of this series, at the end of submitting week by week to the authority of the word of God, trying our best to obey it, falling down and getting up and trying again, that we would be better partners in the gospel. We'd be more purposeful. We'd be more passionate that we could say we've made progress. That's the purpose of the whole series. Now for this sermon. Here's the big idea, really simple. It's dark out there, so let's shine our light. Okay? There's this whole passage in a nutshell. Tried to boil it down and boil it down and boil it down. There you go. Now, since that's hard for me, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little more extended thought that draws out a few more of the nuances of this passage, that we must shine in a dark and twisted time by refusing to grumble and argue as we hold on to God's life-giving truth and his word that, that gives us a life of purpose and sacrificial love that multiplies our influence. To me, that's, that's the whole section in one sentence. I know it's a long run on sentence, <laughs> but there it is. There's the whole passage. Now let's, let's go back through it. So what I want to do is we're going to go through this very carefully. We're going to look at what God's life-giving truth says, and then we're going to look at how we can apply it. I think application on this one's the problem. In the end of the day, it's not terribly difficult to understand that we should not grumble and argue about anything. Some people would want to grumble and argue about that teaching, right? So it's not that hard to get that idea. It's really hard to do, okay? So let's let's jump into it. So we need need to, in our dark, we're going to be shining our little light, but we need to get to God's transforming truth to do it. So let's just go through the passage. It's uh, been read for us a couple times now, but we're going to, We're going to go through it. We're going to go through this carefully. So do everything or do all things. And uh, I think we we can stop right there. That's uh, that's incredibly broad, isn't it? You know, in uh, marriage counseling, one of the things they tell you is try to avoid always or never statements, you know, because sometimes they're emotional, but I'm not going to say never. They're rarely, (laughs) they're rarely accurate, right? You always, you never, you know, it's it's just like, well, This isn't the case. Here, Paul's like, in everything, do everything. This is is so broad. This is so inclusive. It's like, can you think of anything? 
If you just thought of something, that's included. Okay? If it exists, it's included. Every sphere of life, every aspect of life, your work, your play, your, your talking, your sleeping, your rising, all of it, all of it falls under this. So incredibly broad. Do everything. He invites us really into an enormous scope. And it says, do everything without grumbling. And this word's interesting, kind of hard to translate. There's times in the New Testament where the New Testament authors are so rooted in the Old Testament that the ideas really come from there and they just translate it. They just translate it into another language. So the word here probably in mind is, comes probably from the Old Testament in a different language and it's murmuring. Okay? And I think they just translated this more Old Testament idea. And murmuring is kind of an interesting word. It's like one of those words that means what it is. You know, where you're like, you ever have an aha moment? Like, aha! You're like, why do you call it aha? Because, like I just said, aha! You know, it is, it is what it sounds like. And that's this, automatopoeia, right? The murmuring. You're like, why is it called murmuring? Because it's sort of this murmuring. You know, it's just sort of this mumbling, grumbling, sort of complaining. Have you ever heard someone murmur? You know, it's sort of like, you don't tell me, you're not going to tell me, I know, you're gonna, I know, you know, it's like, sort of like there's these peaks and valleys and there's intelligible speech, like maybe once every little bit, you know, like, you know, you're grumpy, maybe, you know, like your governor tell me not to do this, I'm going to do this, you're going to tell me, you know, you're her, 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 and then don't tell me, you know, and it's like, okay, that's murmuring right there, that's grumbling, that's complaining, Sort of a muttering, sort of mumbling, complaining. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it really is just flowing out of discontent and disappointment. So there's, we don't murmur or grumble. And it says don't dispute or argue. And so this, this is really more, I think, flowing out of it. So we've got to keep this conjunction together. Because it's like, you know, there are times when you should argue. There's things that should be argued about. There's things you shouldn't just passively accept everything. But it really is flowing out of the first part of this. And it's more the idea that we need to understand that this is more uh, an argument that kind of comes out of our desires and preferences that aren't being met. Sort of arguing for your own way. And uh, then it drives us to a central purpose. So we get the, the, get the grumbling. I know, I saw this guy. Looked like he was probably grumbling. You know, I don't know. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was saying something really joyful, but it was hard for me uh, to imagine that he was. And uh, so we, we, we first we have to do this without, without grumbling, without disputing, without arguing. Different translations, all the same idea. And uh, then, then it's the purpose, though. The grammar is driving us to a purpose. And uh, to be honest, I'd never caught this nuance before. So there's a series of purpose clauses that are kind of linked together, but it leads us to this. The reason we shouldn't grumble and argue and dispute about everything and murmur is because then we need to be a light shining in a twisted and crooked generation. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but the, this is a missional purpose. And that makes sense, I guess. Because if you've had someone who's constantly disputing and arguing over everything, has anyone ever told you you're argumentative? It's kind of tough, right? What do you say to that? No, I'm not. You know, <laughs> you're like, uh, uh, maybe, maybe then. You know, because if you say, if you're argumentative or you're defensive, you're like, no, I'm not. Or you're like, well, okay, maybe it's just time to say nothing then or think about it a little bit. But uh, the purpose is, it's not attractive, right? Someone's muttering and complaining and disputing about everything. You're not like, you know what? I want to spend more time with you. And uh, I would just love to, I'd love to be like you. Can you tell me your secret? It's not a real attractive thing, is it? And so the purpose here is to say that we would shine our lights. Now this goes back to the ministry of Jesus. I think this is profound. This is one of John's I am statements. I am the light of the world. And that he came to bring light into our dark world. And then he sends us out as lights. And you, we now are his lights. And so Jesus came as the light and then we are... We are to extend that ministry and we are to carry out his light. Now, it takes us then into who we are to be. And this is, again, part of this purpose, this string of purpose clauses. So uh, that we are, that we may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. 
So blameless and innocent are, I think, are, are pretty straightforward. Again, I, I don't think the notion here is flawless perfection because that's unobtainable. And, and scripture makes that clear in, in other cases. That, that no one is righteous, no, not one. No one's, no one's nailing it and sticking the landing and then God's like, oh, wow, you did that so well, you don't even need the cross. No one's doing that. We're not talking about perfection here, but I think it's blameless. We'd be innocent to the charges. Now that being blameless doesn't mean you're not going to be blamed. And being innocent doesn't mean you're going to be accused. I traced out these words throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament and just, I was interested to see who's the object of this verb. If there's murmuring going on, what are they murmuring about? Or who are they murmuring to? And if there's accusing going on, who's in the New Testament, you know who's the object of this verb more than anyone else? Jesus. This verb occurs in the Gospels quite a bit and they accuse Jesus and they, they laid accusation against Jesus. Doesn't mean he was guilty of it. So being, having a blameless life doesn't mean you're not going to be blamed. Lots of blameless people get blamed. In the Old Testament, the one who's the object of this verb more than any other is either God or Moses. <laughs> Moses actually gets a lot of murmuring and complaining. You could say that's the short history of that section is the story of rebellion and complaint. It's just one after another. So it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen, but you're just not, it's not going to be true. It's not going to be right. It's not going to be justified. And it says we're children of God. This is a huge piece of our identity. That come what may, you are a child of God. You are his. And you need to live that way. But when everything else is flying out the window, when everything else is going wrong, this is a piece of bedrock identity that we can come back to, that you are a son or a daughter of the king. And in the consummation of his history, there's going to be a big family dinner, and there's going to be a little nameplate there with your name on it. Because you're a daughter of the king. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. If you belong to Christ, if you are in Christ, if you responded in faith to the gospel, then you are a son or a daughter of God. You will never have a more lofty position or title than that. And to be without blemish, he says, to be without blemish. I think Paul is drawing into the imagery of the sacrificial system here. And that, um, I think that's made even doubly more strong when he talks about that I am a drink offering being poured out on your behalf. So I think Paul has in mind here without blemish as in, as in being a sacrificial lamb. So, where do we do this? In what context are we playing out this drama? Well, it tells us it's in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So uh, I think we could also say in darkness because that's actually assumed by the imagery of light. But we, we are told here about this twisted and perverse generation. <laughs> do I even need to linger here? <laughs> do, do, you, do you believe that this is true? I mean, to me, it's almost like it can't get any worse than it is. I was reading about some and just talking even before the service, I know this is some of your reality, that they're launching several probes into price gouging over people who are taking advantage of the COVID crisis, <clears throat> paying to you farmers less than ever and charging more than ever and nothing in the supply chain justifies that. And so between the low prices offered and the high prices gathered, sometimes 400, 500, 600 percent, inflation, and now several probes into price gouging, because that's illegal. You know, you look at what's going on up in the Twin Cities right now, and yes, there's legitimate anger over, over something horrible that happened. I think there, should, there is such a thing as righteous anger. And God says, even the blood from the ground cries out to me. And so God is bothered by the wanton waste of life in reckless and potentially even evil ways. At a certain point, you can't say, I didn't mean to. When you have reckless disregard for human life, you say, well, if that's even true, then you should have meant to. 
protect life. I think that's actually part of your job. So there's legitimate anger, there's legitimate, and then there's others who are taking advantage of it. And this has always been the case. It's like, things are really bad, let's make it a little worse. There's a growing darkness, I know what would help, let's start fires. I read one story of an African-American fireman in the Twin Cities, worked two jobs, maybe some of you read this story too, worked several jobs, finally earned up enough money to start his business, then COVID hit, and then the looters burned his place to the ground. And then people in the morning helping him dig out, you know, and he's just like, I don't think we need to illustrate this, do we? You don't need to, you're like, well, Pastor, you're the one illustrating. Okay, well, then I'll stop. But uh, this is the reality that we live in. And this is the context that we're supposed to do the Lord's work in. Then we're told to hold fast to the word of life, or in some cases, the word of truth. I think the fact that this is difficult to translate speaks to how integrated those two things are. The word of life is the word of truth. The word of truth is the word of life. It's both because it's life-giving truth. That's actually, it's kind of a medical term. It gets to this idea of life-giving truth. So you're like, is it life-giving? Yes. Is it truth? Yes. It's life-giving truth. And we're supposed to hang on to it. This is one of those white-knuckle things. You know, you hang on to this. Looking at this picture of tug of war. It reminded me one time uh, we played tug of war. We do this at, at Camp Victory. And uh, they would always do this like campers against the counselors thing. You know, but there's only like 10 or 12 counselors, and there was like 70 or 100 kids, right? And you're like, the counselors are like, we know what's going to happen. We're going to be like water skiing <laughs> into, the, into the mud, you know? So I remember one time it was a tie. You're like, how do you get a tie in a tug of war? And it's because one of the leaders snuck over and tied our rope to an oak tree. And uh, <laughs> I think the kids knew the jig was up when we let our hands go, you know, and they're like, hey, wait, wait, you, know, like, you cheated. And you're like, yes, we did. But um, we didn't lose. And uh, so there's times when you just say, you got to grab hold of this, white knuckles, and you're going to pull for all it's worth. This is what God's asking us to grab hold of the word of truth. Grab hold of his word and don't let go no matter what. Whether you feel like it or whether you don't, hold fast. And then we find joy in meaningful suffering. Now, some of you is like, those words should not all go together like that. You could, you could talk about meaningful suffering, but, but not joy. And, and this is indeed what, what Paul is, is taking them into. Because he says, Again, see these purpose clauses, so that, so that. There's a series of these purpose clauses through the whole text. He's driving us. He's driving us to this penultimate purpose. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. Okay, so this was something that happened. They would pour out a drink offering. And that's what he's saying. This is my life. My life is being poured out. And he says, so I'm glad and I rejoice. And he's talking about his death even. He doesn't die here, but he's offered up his life as a sacrifice. And so we see this, that there can be joy in meaningful suffering. There can be joy in what he's calling them. And he says, and also I want you to rejoice and be glad with me. This isn't masochism. This is not finding pleasure in pain. This is allowing a larger vision of God to give you a joy that transcends the trial. That's totally different than masochism. It's a broader vision, and it's a broader purpose. So we run, and running and working in vain are, are, is the opposite of purpose. Right? Have you ever done this? Have you ever had a project, or you've done something where you look at the end of it, and you go... That was a complete waste. That was a complete waste. Maybe for some of you, a storm wiped something out. And you're like, I worked really hard. I did everything I was supposed to do. And then when it came to the receiving the fruits of that, literally or figuratively, it's just not there. This happens in all walks of life. It can happen in agriculture, obviously. It happens in others. I remember a guy spent two, three years on a project 
poured their heart and soul into it. The company's like, ah, thanks. Threw it in the dumpster. You're like, I did that in vain. What is it for? Made some state-of-the-art thing, now it's a paperweight. Remember one guy that had worked on this computer and he said he went with his kid to this thing and he found it in a museum. <laughs> he said, I was so depressed. That was state-of-the-art when I worked on it. Now I feel old. You know, and he's like, now it's a museum piece. Remember when they used to do this? You know, you can say that that's like the worst feeling in the world. You know, if it's a project or if it's a little season in life or you fix up a car and someone crashes it, that's not a good feeling. But it, you come to the end of your whole life, you look at the whole thing, and you say it was all in vain, that is like one of the darkest, saddest, most depressing realities. When people go to that place, oftentimes they take their own life. And Paul is saying, I don't want to run in vain. I don't want to have looked in vain. And he's seeking the larger purpose in missional suffering. Suffering for the cause of Christ. Suffering to advance the mission. Missional suffering is not wasted. Jesus suffered missionally for us. And that is indeed what Paul is inviting them into. All right, so now we need to apply the Word of God. One of the things I do when I preach is I try to just look and look and just re-examine and say, what does the Word of God have for us? Okay, so we try to hold that up. Hold up. What does the Word of God have for us? And try to take some time and say, what is our present reality? What is our experience right now? And is there a gap between our present reality and what God wants for us? And if there's a gap... For the people of God, we need to close that gap through obedience. And I tell you, today's one of those days where understanding what the text says is not hard. It's uncomfortably clear and simple. The real challenge here is doing it. Okay, So let's linger here, because if we're not going to be doers of the word, it does no good. In fact, maybe even a little more harm, because we're a little more accountable. For those who have been given much will need to demonstrate that they've used that. So, first of all, we can see that we need to open up every, every area to the life of faith. For the Christian, you know, this is like in everything. In everything. Okay, so that means every sphere of your life. If your life is segmented and fragmented, that you have a family part and you have a faith part, but your faith part's not going into the family part, that's not God's plan. If you have a work part of your life, you know, remember, you know, those, some people like trays, like you do the potlucks and, and they get things and you're like, I don't want my jello touching the hot dish, you know. So, you know, it's like, because then it melts and then I got green hot dish and, you know, it's like jello's over here and hot dish is over there. That's why they sell those little dividers, right? Some people, that's what their life looks like. Okay, you're like, I don't, no, 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 my work's not going to touch my faith. Because if I did that, I might not make as many deals, I might not, that's... That's hard. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to put my faith over here and my work over here, my play over here, my family over there. What this verse is getting at is that there's none of that. It's all one big thing. And if there's dividers, you need to tear them down and integrate your faith into every aspect of your life in all things. God wants his glory. God wants the gospel to invade every nook and cranny of your heart, every nook and cranny of your life, every nook and cranny of all of creation that the gospel would go forth with power. We need to stop grumbling. That's what the text says. Right? And, you know, I, this is one of those things where I know I illustrated with what's going on out there, but if we're honest, there can be a fair bit of grumbling in the church. I know some pastors that aren't in the ministry anymore because they felt like that's all they did is responding to complaints, responding to grumbling, responding to people who want things a certain way. One of the things that's, this is why this is so important. When a church is not on mission, they're going to grumble. Because when you're on mission, when you, when you understand what it is you're here to do, like, once you know why God's put you on this planet, you, there's no other way to live. And you're not caring. You don't care. 
if your jello is touching your hot dish anymore. You know, once you have your purpose, you're like, this is why I exist. God has created me to do this. You're not grumbling about silly stuff that doesn't matter. The grander vision of God has resized your reality and there's no going back. So, there are so many churches that are walking in circles. You know, there's a reason why the wilderness generation in Exodus didn't go anywhere. That journey should have taken them like not even a month. Over 40 years, they're walking in circles and they're fighting all the time and they're grumbling and they're murmuring. I don't like the food and I don't like this and I don't like that. And weren't there enough graves in Egypt? You know, and all of a sudden, 400 years of backbreaking slavery wasn't so bad. It was kind of like a resort. We need to stop grumbling. We need to stop needless disputes. So much of the church's time and energy is wasted in needless disputes. It just bleeds off energy. It bleeds off focus. It bleeds off momentum. And I think it ends up making like a missional pursuit. It's like you're on a car trip, but you keep stopping to see the largest ball of string. You know, or have you ever had it where you're like, don't make me pull this car over, right? Have you heard that? You know, like, I don't, don't make me, don't make me go back there. Okay, so it's like we're on a car trip, but we have to keep pulling the car over. Because there's this fighting in the back seat. You touch me, you touch me, don't touch me. There's a line right here, right here. Do not cross the line. You cross the line, Mom, you know. And it's like, we're going somewhere here. You know, and the needless disputes and arguing and grumbling and complaining. We keep pulling the car over and we can't get to the Grand Canyon. And uh, there's something bigger there. There's something better there than arguing in the back seat. I tell you, there's so many churches that they aren't driving anywhere anymore. They just said, forget it. Let's just sit on the side of the road and argue over who's touching who and, and uh, whose turn it is with the game and what movie is going to play in the thing. And it's just like the parents have just thrown their hands up and they said, that's it. Let's not even try to go anywhere because I just get on the freeway and I have to pull back off again. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. The church was not meant to sit on the side of the road and referee arguments and grumbling. I know since this is a big problem right now, that's the best time to preach a message like this, right? <laughs> is uh, when, when you're not feeling like, oh my gosh, this is for us, right? But I think this is good preventative medicine where if you feel like, you know, just, we'll get to, we'll get to that next. Understand where you are. We need to understand our context. If it seems dark out there, you know why it seems dark out there? Because it is. Does this time, this epic we live in, does it just seem twisted and warped and wicked and wrong? Does it seem that way? You know why? Because it is. That's why. It's that simple. You know, I, I've noticed with Christians two tendencies. Either they try to deny the darkness, they minimize it. Oh, it's not that dark. Your eyes get used to it. You know? And uh, you're like, don't worry about the darkness. It's not that bad. You know, they try to minimize it. And then other Christians just get angry about it. And I, there's a lot of angry Christians. I like that darkness. The irony here is sometimes Christians grumble and argue about the darkness. Like, this used to be a Christian nation. And it's not anymore. And they just mumble and grumble and argue. And, you know, like, and okay, how's that working for us? You know, there's a, um, a tool, and we just started looking at it as leaders. This is something that the, our, our free denomination in the North Central District, which is mostly Minnesota, a couple churches in Iowa, they looked at some metrics, like, like some, just think of it as like a dashboard, like if we're going fast, how fast are we going? You know, if we have fuel, how much fuel do we have? Uh, and this is one of the questions they asked. So I'm going to ask this of you, Okay. They asked us to rate our church's experience, but the church's experience is a collection of the individuals in it. Okay, so rate your commitment to adapting to dramatic cultural shifts in our day. First of all, anybody think that's not the case? Does anybody think that we don't have dramatic cultural shifts like this week? Do you think like last week 
that the entire National Guard of Minnesota would be called out? Never happened since World War II? 20,000 National Guard members guarding every street? Okay, I didn't think that was coming, all right? So dramatic cultural shifts, yes, absolutely. Now, are we reeling and angry? Or are we vigorously pursuing holiness and harvest? Do you see the different reactions? For so many Christians, they get so consumed by this, they get angry and we're reeling. Paul doesn't minimize the darkness. He does it. It's dark. It's twisted. Does it seem twisted? Yeah, it does, because it is. That's why. But how do we respond to that? Are we reeling and angry? Or are we vigorously pursuing holiness and harvest? I tell you, the more believers that transition out of being reeling and angry and start vigorously pursuing holiness and harvest, that leads to revival. Because even lost people know that darkness is dark. So how shiny are you? This is just a question, right? He says, this is God's plan, that he's left us among whom you are to shine. Now, someday we're going to get an upgrade. It says we're going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. That's really shiny. But right now, he sent us out as lights into a dark world. So how shiny are you? I tell you, if you're consumed by arguments and bitter, like, I've heard this said, and I think it's true. What would happen if an unbeliever watched a church business meeting? I know some, I know some people like, oh my gosh, if any non-Christian saw a church business meeting, they would never come to Christ. And you're like, why? Because we bicker and argue and because we're contentious and divisive and we want our own way and we grumble and we complain and we'll read this verse, say yes and amen. God's word is our final authority in life and practice. Now, let's start grumbling. And it's not very shiny. It's not very attractive. If you can think of your workplace or your, if there's, there's someone who's constantly grumbling, complaining, and arguing, they do not have any influence. People normally don't spend any more time with them than they have to. Hold fast to the word of truth. I think this is a commitment. I think as a church, you do a good job of this. Hold fast to the word of truth. This is kind of one of those commitments, when I feel like it and when I don't. The more you don't feel like it, the more you need to. Live a life of purpose. Find a reason. This is key. If you find a reason to live for, you've found your reason that you're willing to die for. If you don't have something you're going to live for, you aren't going to have anything you're going to die for. And if you don't have anything you're willing to die for, that's no way to live. Jesus had his reason. You and me. Paul had his reason. He said, I want to make Christ known. And I want you to find joy in that. See, he doesn't want to run in vain. He did, Paul doesn't want you to come to the end of your life and say, oh, it was all in vain. I wasted all my time. It was for nothing. What a horrible way to live. The very opposite of running in vain, working in vain, living in vain, is living with purpose. That's why he wants us to grow in our passion, in our purpose, in our progress as full partners in the gospel. Just end our time in the word here with imagining. Could you imagine... If Christians all over this land all of a sudden just spontaneously started obeying this passage, could you imagine it? What would the church, 300,000 churches in our country, what if every Christian in the United States spontaneously obeyed this passage? And we stopped arguing and we stopped grumbling. Could you imagine how different things would look like? Imagine a light that has illuminated our darkness, but it wasn't fires. It wasn't looters. It wasn't angry Christians. It was a humble group of people that said, we are your children. And this is a twisted and warped and dark generation, but we are going to try our best to hold up our little light and shine in this darkness could you imagine a group of Christians who held fast to the word? They held on to what God said, no matter what, no matter how twisted things got, no matter how countercultural it became, no matter how weird it seemed, 
They grabbed hold of God's words with white knuckles and said, we will do this until the end. Could you imagine what it would look like if every single person who calls this church their home decided to live a life of purpose like Paul did? Could you imagine if every single person said, you know what, I want to look at my life as being poured out for others. That I don't want to live a life in vain. If every single believer here found why God put them on this planet and started living that way. And that God would hold us up even though we have trembling hands and we gave him our time, our talent, and our treasure and said, God, use us. You know, to do this, we can't do it on our own. We need Christ. If you're feeling weak, if you're feeling worn, and you're saying, I can't do all that, you're right. You're right, you can't. But you can do all things. But you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And when we are weak, and when we call out to him, saying, yeah, not I, but through you, Lord Jesus, we'll do these things. He says, through your weakness, I will proclaim my strength. This dark and twisted world we live in desperately needs our little shining lights. It's dark out there, so go shine for Jesus. We're going to welcome you to a time of worship next week as we come together again, and we'll record it for those that are not able to be with us. Go in his peace.